This is Imaging of Malignant Adrenal Masses. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. So to give you an overview of the lecture, pheochromocytoma is a potentially malignant mass of the adrenal gland. Remember, 10% are malignant, but we discussed that in a separate lecture, which you can check out. So in this lecture, I'll talk about adrenal metastases, including the fabled collision tumor, and then also adrenal cortical carcinoma and adrenal lymphoma. So starting with a case, this was a CT scan of the abdomen with intravenous contrast through the level of the adrenal glands. And you can see these two large mixed cystic and solid masses in the region of the adrenal glands bilaterally. If we look at the coronal reformatted image, you get a sense of their large size and the mass effect they exert against the underlying kidneys. Also, there are multiple ill-defined hepatic metastases. So these findings are typical for adrenal metastases. And adrenal metastases are the most common malignant lesion involving the adrenal gland. The most common sites of primary malignancy that spread to the adrenal gland include lung, that's the most common, kidney, particularly renal cell carcinoma, breast cancer, melanoma, and then also colorectal carcinoma. Anytime you see masses that are bilateral and greater than 3 centimeters, you should be concerned about adrenal metastases. Remember, though, that pheochromocytoma can be bilateral 10% of the time, especially if there's a genetic predisposition, then the incidence may be even higher. This patient, though, had small cell lung carcinoma with hepatic and adrenal metastases. Now, here's a different case showing an example of renal cell carcinoma metastatic to the adrenal gland. You can see that there's a heterogeneously hyperdense mass there in the right adrenal gland, and this was a patient who had had a nephrectomy from renal cell carcinoma. You can see surgical clips in the left renal fossa there. Also, this image represents a hepatic arterial or pancreatic phase image where the portal vein and hepatic artery enhance maximally, and this is the best phase to detect hypervascular masses throughout the liver. It's also a great phase to detect hypervascular pancreatic masses. And you can see this peripherally hyperenhancing centrally necrotic mass in the pancreatic tail. Remember that the most common metastasis to the pancreas is from renal cell carcinoma from the kidney. Now, this patient has a later portal venous phase image where the hepatic veins are starting to enhance and the rest of the hepatic parenchyma is also enhancing. And notice that it's very difficult to see any hepatic metastases on this phase. And that's why it's important to get a hepatic arterial phase image whenever there's a concern for possible hypervascular metastases. You can again see that right adrenal metastasis, which is enhancing a bit more now, and the pancreatic tail metastasis is also still apparent. Now, up to 50% of adrenal masses in patients with known malignancy might actually be benign, and that's because adrenal adenomas are so common we often just see them incidentally. And that's where PET-CT becomes invaluable. And this was an example of lung adenocarcinoma with a metastatic focus to the right adrenal gland. Generally on PET, malignancy is metabolically active and will take up the radio tracer and appear avid, hot. And a general rule is if an adrenal gland is more avid than the adjacent liver, then that increases suspicion for malignancy. But we can get a bit more specific than that. There was a study by Dr. Metzer that evaluated malignant adrenal lesions compared to adenomas. And it was found that an SUV cutoff of 3.1 was the most accurate predictor of whether an adrenal nodule was malignant or not. An SUV is the standardized uptake value, quantitative measurement of the metabolic activity on PET. Another study by Dr. Watanabe also looked at adrenal cortical adenomas and metastases, but instead compared the ratio of the adrenal to liver SUV and actually found that a cutoff value of 1.37 was actually 100% specific to differentiate these two adrenal abnormalities. Also, they found that that ratio was more accurate than just the SUV max alone, or even doing an adrenal to spleen SUV ratio. I'm glad they included the spleen in this study because I feel like the spleen often gets left out. It's very lonely there in the left upper quadrant. <laughs> so the bottom line with this ratio, it can be helpful in cases where you have equivocal avidity when you're inspecting it visually or if the Maximum SUV is, is just around 3, 3.1. A ratio will help you determine if there's a metastatic focus with greater specificity. Here's an example of a patient with a known history of lung cancer. And on this non-contrast CT scan, there's a left adrenal nodule. If we look at the PET data fused on that CT scan, you can see that this nodule is avid. And visually, it does look like it's more avid than the liver. If we actually measure the SUV value, we're getting a maximum SUV of 4.2 and the adrenal to liver ratio was greater than 1.4. So these findings are extremely suspicious for a metastatic focus 
Indeed, on a follow-up PET CT only two months later, this mass had increased significantly in size and avidity, now with a maximum SUV of 14.2. And if we look at the lung bases, you can see that the avid right lower lobe lung cancer is present there, and there are also ipsilateral metastases to the right hilum and mediastinum, all metabolically active. So this is an example of metastatic lung cancer to mediastinal and hilar lymph nodes as well as the left adrenal gland. So let's look at another case. This patient also had a history of lung cancer, and we're looking at T1 in-phase MRI images through the adrenal glands. There's a left adrenal nodule superiorly there, and then another one more inferior laterally, also on the left there. If we look at the T1 opposed phase MRI images, and you can tell that these are posed phase or out of phase because there's India ink or etching artifacts surrounding all the organs at the fat interface, you can see that the larger of the two nodules demonstrate signal dropout, it becomes dark, as does the smaller one arising from that lateral limb of the adrenal gland. So these are both diagnostic of lipid-rich adrenal adenomas. The patient also had a PET-CT at that time for staging purposes. And again, you can see that there's the larger left adrenal nodule and the smaller one there. Both have avidity similar to the liver. They're not more avid than the liver. And I'll tell you that the max SUV was less than 3.1. However, if we look at a follow-up PET-CT done three years later, what do you see now? Now there is increased avidity demonstrated by that larger left adrenal nodule, whereas the smaller one is unchanged. Now if we measure the SUV for this nodule, we get 5.7, which is consistent with metastasis, and this was a collision tumor. So these are rare. A collision tumor is when two histologically distinct tumors abut or are near each other in the adrenal gland. The most common collision tumor has actually been reported to be myelolipoma and adenoma, but we're more worried about the metastatic type, as in this case, a metastasis and an adenoma. And PET-CT is actually the best way to characterize these masses without doing a biopsy. But there are other modalities that you can still make this diagnosis on. Like in this case, so this was a patient with a history of renal cell carcinoma, and we have in-phase and opposed phase T1-weighted MRI images, and do you see anything? Yeah, there's a left adrenal nodule there on the in-phase image, and on the out-of-phase image, it completely drops out. It becomes very dark, diagnostic of a lipid-rich adrenal adenoma and benign. Now, if we jump ahead nine years later, we have these three separate MRIs all showing opposed phase t weighted images, and these MRIs are arranged oldest on the right-hand side and newest on the left-hand side. And what do you see there? Well, you see the adrenal adenoma has the signal dropout again, but you also have this new area of defect in the area of dropout, and it's enlarging over time. Here's that T1 opposed phase image, again showing the defect within the area of signal dropout. And if we look at the post-contrast image from the same MRI, you can see that there's a rim-enhancing lesion within this adrenal gland. Also on the T1 fat-suppressed coronal post-contrast images, there are multiple solid-enhancing renal masses indicating recurrent metastatic renal cell carcinoma. And this was another example of a collision tumor, this time a renal cell metastasis to a gland containing an adrenal adenoma. And two teaching points from this case, renal cell carcinoma metastases can be extremely slow growing and can occur many years after the initial tumor presentation, as in this case, which was nine years after that initial MRI that I showed you. I've seen cases present as far as 20 years after the initial presentation of renal cell carcinoma coming back with metastatic disease. Also, the T1 opposed phase images can be really helpful in identifying collision tumors by seeing this defect in an area of signal dropout. This is particularly useful if you're reading an examination done without intravenous contrast. And this same principle also works for identifying lesions within a fatty liver or osseous lesions within the spine, because both the fatty liver and the bone marrow will demonstrate signal dropout on opposed phase images, and if you suddenly see a defect in that dropout that wasn't there before, that indicates that there's probably a new lesion. All right, let's move on to a different malignant adrenal mass. So this was a 73-year-old female who presented with abdominal pain. And you can see that there's a very large left adrenal mass, heterogeneous, and with a few areas of calcifications as denoted by those green arrows. The patient also had an MRI, and on these T1 and T2 weighted images, again, you see this large left adrenal mass, very heterogeneous. It has areas of internal T1 hypointensity and T2 hyperintensity, fairly isointensity adjacent CSF, and that's consistent with fluid indicating central necrosis. 
These wedge-shaped peripheral areas indicate hemorrhage, and both the areas of hemorrhage and central necrosis do not enhance on the post-contrast images here, but the surrounding bulk of the solid tumor does. And this is a T2 coronal image showing, again, the large size of the mass superjacent to the left kidney and the central T2 hyperintensity isointense to that CSF in the spinal canal indicating necrosis. And this was an adrenal cortical carcinoma. So these are rare primary malignant neoplasms of the adrenal gland, and they have a bimodal age distribution. So they can present in the first decade of life in children and the fourth to fifth decades of life in adults, although there is some variation. And one important fact to remember about these tumors is they might be functioning, particularly in female patients, meaning they can secrete hormones. And when they do, Cushing syndrome as opposed to Kahn syndrome is the most common. And unfortunately, they have an extremely poor prognosis. So what are the features of these tumors? Well, they tend to be very large, meaning they often present greater than six centimeters in size. And they often have areas of non-enhancing internal hemorrhage and necrosis, like in this case. So you can see these peripheral T1 hyperintense wedge-shaped areas within the tumor that are also T2 dark on this lowermost T2 fat suppressed image. And that indicates hemorrhage. However, though, just on these images alone, you can't really differentiate this from fat, right? Because fat will also be T2 bright and it will be dark on a T2 fat suppressed image. So what sequence would you like to see next to confirm that this is actually hemorrhage and not fat? Right, a T1 fat suppressed image. And on this image, you can see that these wedge-shaped areas are T1 hyperintense, whereas the subcutaneous fat has been suppressed. So this is consistent with hemorrhage. And another feature of these tumors is that they can calcify in about a third. So venous invasion is common with adrenal cortical carcinoma, and when there's metastatic disease, it tends to spread to lymph nodes, lung, bones, and liver. So let's look at another case. This is a large adrenal cortical carcinoma on the left, very heterogeneous. You can see some areas of calcification there within the anterior aspect of the tumor. And this coronal image shows the underlying kidney being displaced by the extremely large tumor. This is much larger than six centimeters. And then what do you notice on this coronal image? It's very subtle, but there's an area of left renal vein invasion, and that was confirmed at surgery. So anytime you see an adrenal mass that's larger than six centimeters and invading into the adjacent renal vein or even inferior vena cava, that's extremely suspicious for adrenal cortical carcinoma. Here's another case, different patient with a left adrenal cortical carcinoma, large and heterogeneous. And you also notice that there's this irregular pleural thickening at the right lung base. And the features of malignant pleural thickening are nodularity, a thickness greater than one centimeter, circumferential thickening, and pleural thickening abutting the mediastinal surface. And this has all those features. So this was consistent with pleural metastatic disease. And this coronal image just again shows the large size of that left adrenal cortical carcinoma, the right malignant pleural thickening with a pleural effusion. Here's yet another left-sided adrenal cortical carcinoma. And what do you notice on the opposed phase image? There's a small area of signal dropout indicating the presence of microscopic or intracytoplasmic fat. And you also see signal dropout throughout the vertebral body there in the adjacent spine, which is totally normal and physiologic. So just be aware that ACC can rarely have foci of microscopic fat with signal dropout on the out-of-phase, opposed-phase images. But you don't want to confuse that with adrenal adenoma. This is just a small area of signal dropout. And if we look at the remaining images for this particular adrenal cortical carcinoma, it's heterogeneous and solid on the T2 fat suppressed image. And it's very heterogeneously enhancing and vascular on the post-contrast image. So these findings are not consistent with adrenal adenoma. And also the large size of the mass would raise suspicion. However, even though adrenal cortical carcinoma tends to present at a large size, it has to start small at some point, and it could conceivably be confused with adrenal adenoma if caught in the early stage. So that's just something to keep in mind. All right, let's talk about the final malignant adrenal mass that we'll be discussing in this presentation. Here's a contrast enhanced CT scan through the level of the adrenal glands, and what do you notice? There's this adrenoform mass-like homogeneous thickening of the left adrenal gland. It looks like it's a bit hypo-enhancing. The patient also had an MRI, and if you look at these in-phase and opposed-phase T1-weighted images, you can again see that adrenoform mass homogeneous, and it's not showing any signal dropout on the opposed-phase series. So this is not consistent with a lipid-rich adrenal adenoma. It could still be adrenal hyperplasia, since that doesn't always show signal dropout, but it does look a bit too mass-like for that.
Looking a little more closely at this mass-like thickening, you can see that it's relatively iso-intense on T1-weighted images relative to skeletal muscle, and on T2, it's heterogeneous and mildly hyper-intense relative to skeletal muscle. Looking at the post-contrast series, it's homogeneously hypo-enhancing, and this was biopsied and demonstrated to represent adrenal lymphoma. So adrenal lymphoma is rare in the primary form. It's more common to see it in the setting of diffuse disease. It often presents as round or adrenoform in shape. And on CT, it's usually hypo-enhancing. On MRI, it's T1 iso-intense, T2 hyper-intense relative to skeletal muscle, like in this case. And it usually shows minimal progressive enhancement. A key feature, though, is it tends to show restricted diffusion. And that can help you differentiate this from adrenal hyperplasia. And on PET imaging, it's often hypermetabolic, which is also helpful. Now, this is a different case, more dramatic, showing bilateral large adrenal masses that are adrenoform in shape, hypodense and ill-defined. And you can also see that there is lymphadenopathy in the portahepatous peripancreatic region and some infiltration of hypodensity into that left kidney. On this image, you can again see that portahepatous lymphadenopathy, also portal cable, and the infiltrative hypodensity within that left kidney is more apparent. And this was a patient that had bilateral large B-cell adrenal lymphoma, also with metastatic lymphadenopathy and left renal involvement. Also notice that all of these masses are relatively isodense to skeletal muscle on CT, which is a typical feature for lymphoma, homogeneous and isodense to skeletal muscle on CT. So adrenal lymphoma is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and it's usually diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Symptoms are often B-cell symptoms like fever, night sweats, weight loss, and also adrenal insufficiency is a common presentation. They tend to be bilateral as opposed to unilateral, as in this case, and they may invade into the adjacent kidney. Hey, we made it to the end of malignant adrenal masses. Thanks for your attention. And if you enjoyed this lecture, it would be phenomenal if you left a review and subscribed to Radiologist Headquarters on Apple Podcasts. We're on Facebook, and you can like and follow us there. You can also subscribe on YouTube and click the bell icon to receive a notification whenever a new episode comes out. Thank you, and have a great day.